A typical taxpayer-supported shelter that costs about $80 per person per night, Dignity Village costs about $3 a person. So it is more than 20 times less than a typical shelter cost, and it does not cost, cost taxpayers money. In fact, um, it, is, it depends upon their own fundraising, their own resources, and, and contributions, and, and grant writing, and that sort of thing. So the rest of the question, though, um, about their economic scenario is that some of them are going into uh, school while they're stabilizing there. They're looking for jobs. But within the village itself, it has its own economy of direct trading and not, and not requiring money in order to do things together. So people actually um, will help each other to build a house or to tend their garden or to look after something. So um, it's that sort of basis in the village. Bob in the back, and then also get some cards in your chair. We'd love to get information from you before you leave tonight as well. So, right, Bob, go ahead. I'm interested in the eating habits of the group. Do they eat communally, and do they invite uh, outsiders to come in for a meal? Beautiful question. So, um, Bob was asking if uh, what, what their eating habits were in the village, whether they eat communally, and whether they invite other people from outside. Um, so, yeah, they do cook, and they cook in clusters of people, they cook as individuals, but they don't tend to cook as a whole village, um, except occasionally when they have events, and in those cases, they do invite people from outside. They also have huge infusions of leftovers from culinary schools, so it's uh, pretty good to know when that's happening, um, to go out and join them. Oops. Let's go right here, yellow shirt. Yeah, uh, when they go Yeah, it happens in a lot of different ways. Yeah, sorry, good, thanks. Um, he was asking if people that build, build houses there for themselves invest their own money in the projects. It's a great question. Um, I can think of uh, quite a number of examples where people have built their own places. One guy who was working for a construction company as a kind of menial labor, labor and, and built, saving enough money to get out of the village um, would receive donations from the contract from the construction company he was working for and bring those materials back and build with those. His house was only about 80 square feet and it was about as beautiful and efficient as a boat inside. And he knew when he built it, built it that it was going to be left behind for other people. And that all of the structures that are built out there are built in that spirit. So people are at least giving their own time to do it and other people are coming to the village to help them, <coughs> like loaning tools and things like that. Um, if someone cannot get it donated or if it's not coming to them through the waste stream, like the rebuilding center, for instance, um, in Portland. My cell phone's going off. Yeah, it's trying to put me to sleep. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll, put their own, they'll put their own resources in if they need to. Like, for instance, if they can't get a roof, roofing material, then they'll somehow try to, to find that. But if, personally, if I hear of a need out there, then I'll fan out to find it for them. So there's lots of help to be had. Okay, we'll all in the back on the red road there. Oh, yeah. What is the time frame for people that are coming into the community? Is this a destination to come to for a couple of years, or is this a launching path to get into a normal life? This is a great question. Um, and the answer... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the question was, is, is this a long-term strategy, or is, do people come in... Um, with kind of uh, various different um, intentions for how long they'll be there. And uh, initially, what, what we proposed to the city council and what they approved was that there would be a... Huh? We do that. <laughs> do I look ghastly? Um, <laughs> okay, so... Initially, what we proposed to the city, what the village proposed, was um, that it would have a one-third uh, long-term resident population that would be the leadership council and the institutional memory that would train people and help them to be organized. And two-thirds would transition out, hopefully within three months. And it was working pretty well that way um, until 2008, when there was this general collapse of the economy and way less available jobs and way less available funding for, uh, 
for for people, you know, in terms of housing options. So that relationship and that ratio has changed, and the city has been very understanding about that because there's nowhere to go, um, or very few places to go. And fortunately, long-term residents of the village do tend to become more equipped and capable of going out into the larger society. So it is helpful in that way. It can transition. But the, the time has, is taking longer for people to transition out. And um, they're not happy about that. They're, they really want to have opportunities. And it's so hard to find them. So the structures that were built at Dignity Village, did the city want to come in and make sure they're up to code, or they just went ahead and let them build it? Good question. There are so many lovely pieces to that, that, that answer. So he was asking, um, were there any codes involved, or did the city, the city take a hands-off approach? And uh, in the beginning, when they were just tents, the city was just happy that they were under shelter. Um, but once they agreed to the idea of a, of, a, of a place where they would stabilize for long term, they were immediately interested in creating some kind of standards. And uh, the, the Building and Planning Bureau um, only wanted to review it peripherally because they, uh, they, they were saying, you know, if we apply permanent codes to this, will create such a restrictive scenario that the project won't be doable. And we're not talking about health and life safety. We're, we're talking about sort of like the cost of permits. Um, because frankly, everything that's been built out there has been built according to what we call um, a prescriptive path. The kind of just no-brainer sorts of structures um, that can be passed, you know, where you can get an entire house permitted just over the counter. So the construction technology um, and, the, and the spans in structures are really simple. So the building bureau was like, you know, as long as you can lift it with a forklift, we don't need to be involved. So that was their take. But the, the fire bureau, their word really rules. And everybody knows that and they respect it. So the fire bureau comes on site, the inspector comes on site, they have a long-term relationship with, with Scott Edwards, who comes onto the site and he walks the space and he says, all right, you know, make sure you keep these lanes clear. We need at least this much space in between each house. So we've set up actually a planning code that establishes sort of a perimeter or a site for each house to sit on, and then where the house can be pretty much located within setbacks on that overall sort of plot. So it enables people to have gardens and storage, bicycles, outdoor gathering space, as well as a place to live in. And the size of the housing can vary. Um, it can go down as low as 870 square feet and as high as uh, 180 square feet um, for a couple size structure. But great question. There are standards. Barbara and the gentleman in green next. Yeah, my question is about the um, overall governance. How can village is starting out with a 501c3, a 501c3? Yes. Does the village have that or is it? Yes. Dignity Village, well, in order for the city to be able to create, sorry, <laughs> uh, she was asking what is the governance structure, um, she's talking about how Opportunity Village is talking about being a 501c3, and she's wondering if Dignity Village is a 501c3, and, and it is. Um, the city said in order for us to create a long-term relationship with you and give you site control, which is sort of a legal standing, you have to become a legally recognizable entity. So the village um, undertook a process of creating bylaws and creating agreements and structures, and of course, a board and the council. Um, and I think that they would all agree that there have been challenges because they've been really determined to be self-governing. But sometimes, um, you know, as people have transitioned and transition in and transitioned out, um, there hasn't been enough continuity on that board. This is kind of a technicality, but since we're talking about Opportunity Village, I would advise from the beginning to incorporate advisors that don't live in the village to sit at the table at least, even if they don't have sort of a vote, to be present, just give counsel about things. And that helps um, the social culture of the board and council structure to have more stability and continuity over time. The gentleman in green back there. Uh, yes. Question. Next, the woman behind you. Oh, yes. Okay. Does your organization have any backing from donations from Bill Knight? Yeah. <laughs> so, does the uh, organization have 
support from people outside, such as Bill Knight, uh, Bill Knight, yeah, and grant writers. Um, actually, it would be wonderful for more grant writers to to step forward to help out. There, you know, there there's occasionally donations that come from Nike, kind of the long way. Like people will donate shoes, but it won't come directly from Nike. But you know, people aren't aren't, aren't necessarily approaching them to ask either. Yeah, there should be more people, I think, helping out because, frankly, if you're just coming off the street, you know, maybe you have an English degree, I don't know, but maybe you don't have any experience with grant writing, and people who do would really be appreciated, uh, the villagers would appreciate that help. If Dignity had a track team. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right, done. <laughs> talking about Opportunity Village? Yeah. Can someone else take that question? Because I, I have not been working on that master plan. What was the question? Repeat the question. Pods of 30. Okay, well the question was um, concerning the number of units and how to accommodate parking. I can tell you in Portland that uh, the city has capped the amount of parking that Dignity Village can have on site to um, eight cars. And so, it, not everyone can have a car out on the site. So, specific to Opportunity Village, we talked about kind of a pilot program in 30 September initially. So, it would probably be 30 people, um, there'd be couples in the room that have like so there wouldn't necessarily be other 30 structures. But, so that's just kind of like a pilot program, so we can ease into this. Um, parking? Yeah. In parking, I guess we would look to, a lot of times with parking, the cities are. One of our um, site criteria is to locate your uh, transit and bike routes. So cities are often are more lenient in parking requirements when you have mass transit options. So we would look into uh, incorporating some of those. Well, he was just saying that, that they would locate your um, transit routes and try to help people to have bicycles. And that's certainly what's happening at Dignity Village. The transit agency relocated the route <laughs> to the village. But a lot of people have cars. So yeah. how is that incorporated into the financial? You can't just say you can't have a car. Yeah. I don't actually It's something that ended up being a problem over time. And so the city just said, we're not going to allow cars to accumulate here. Um, and it's just a, a, a fact of the village that people can't, can't yeah. have them there. Um, and I know that that could be a hardship for some people. I have a microphone here if somebody needs one. Okay, so, can okay, start on the left side, then go back to the right, so we'll do it, and then you next. How about the microphone? Thank you. At Dignity Village, how do you choose the 30 residents? And how does that progress over time? And what happens to the waiting list? OK. Well, she's, well you've probably all heard that. Dignity Village is, is able to actually, Dignity Village is actually able to have between 60 and 70 people um, at any time. So it's actually a, a little bit bigger number. And they have their own policies for admission. People have to come and apply, they have to be interviewed, they're asked a whole sort of battery of questions. Um, people want to make sure that, the, that those that are admitted into the village are not going to bring unsolvable problems with them. They don't expect them to be perfect, but they do go through a screening process and there is a waiting list. And as far as you know, what the people can do who are waiting, um, you know, Dignity doesn't have the capacity to do much for them. Um, except provide surplus food if they come to the village asking for it. You basically answered my, my, my question about the capacity and the waiting list. How long is the current waiting list, you know? How long it takes for somebody to get in? Um, Dignity's got about a dozen people waiting to get in right now. And the, the length of time, uh, I think, is about three months. And that's because the transition time has, has been taking longer. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the surrounding land use context uh, for the, the project in Portland. And my, I had read that that wasn't the, 
the ultimate site location wasn't the original uh, choice. And can you talk maybe about how uh, other um, of these uh, villages uh, across the country, where are they located in sort of a larger land use context? Well, the Kennedy Village is located out near the airport, which isn't really ideal because they'd rather be closer to services. Originally, they stabilized for several months underneath the west end of the, of the Fremont Bridge. And uh, the city council was working with them there, um, housing advocates and, and people that were coordinating um, affordable housing opportunities were working to help transition people out of that circumstance. And then there was an anonymous complaint from someone in the West Hills who uh, basically activated the complaint-driven system. And you know, one of the things we learned about that system is that somebody could, from Vermont could complain about it. You know? So we had someone who was not even part of the process, trying to be part of the solution, activating the, the, the system upon the village. And so they had to enforce the code, otherwise the city would become liable, which was really unfortunate, because that might have been a great long-term site. So uh, at that point, we transitioned out to the airport. And, but we tried to go to um, a neighborhood circumstance on 37th and Powell. Um, now this was a field where everyone thought, I, mean, I think it was called the Field of Dreams, actually. Um, but it was a place that had been known for decades as having prostitution and drug problems. People had died there. There were needles and syringes. And people, I mean, after, after the police had established that crime lowers and things become cleaner and safer around the village, people were thinking, well, this will be an improvement, certainly eyes on the street kind of thing. But when we went to the, uh, to the neighborhood, it turned out that someone had spread really disingenuous um, flyers all over the neighborhood trying to trigger people. And so lots of people came out very angry, and there was lots of um, unfortunate contention. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and everyone just, the village just backed off, the city council backed off, and they're like, okay, well, we won't even talk about it anymore then. Which I think is unfortunate, because that, that field continues to be a place um, where all sorts of awful things happen. So the village ended up in, near the airport, um, and fortunately they're on a bus line. But they're much farther from the services that would that would otherwise help them, um, you know, to, to pick themselves up. And, and in other cities, I'm not familiar with all of the different circumstances, but I know that locating, you know, the location is always a sensitive issue, and um, people in residential fabric are always concerned. That's for sure. So sometimes um, people will go end up on the periphery of the town, and in some cases without even bus service. But that's the best that they can do. Uh, in some cases, in uh, an area where there's a transition between a residential zone and an industrial zone, they'll just be right on the edge there, sort of kind of near the residential zone. Um, so, I, I, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I personally would be happy to live near Dignity Village, but uh, I can understand people's apprehensions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does Dignity Village draw electrical power off of the grid? And also, uh, obviously, being located in a residential area would be a, an issue. For example, if I wanted to run a business out of my garage or house, I would have to apply with the city. They would canvas the neighborhood. If there was any opposition, then they wouldn't allow me to do that, so. Yeah, in your case, well, they were, the city takes comments and then judges whether or not these concerns are, are, are valid. Um, I mean, everyone's concerns are valid, obviously, but whether or not it bears up, you know, compared to uh, the goals and objectives of the neighborhood, or, or whether or not the, the, the objections are relevant to the code. So there's a process of evaluation. If people complain, it doesn't necessarily take down your, your micro-enterprise in your home. Um, I think, you know, in the case of Dignity, it was on a, on a zone that wasn't designated for habitation. And uh, our very conservative talk show host, uh, Lars Larson, complained, complained to the state land use board and uh, said, well, this is inappropriate use. This is substandard. You can't allow this to happen. So the city said, well, OK, I guess it's time to get in bed. And they said, we're going to turn this thing into a campground then and give it a, a designation so that basically, if it isn't in the code, you can build it. That was amazing. I, I was in that meeting and I said, you guys all look like you just got away with something. And I was talking to the building officials and they said, you know what? 
all we ever do is be restricted. We want to start seeing stuff happen that we've never seen before, but we've heard about it. So, um, they said, you know, theoretically, if you can lift it, if it can be potentially mobile, you can build cob, you can build straw bale, you can build straw clay and this beautiful German wood chip system. Um, as long as it isn't yet in the code and it's temporary and movable, then you can build it. Uh, but you, you have a follow-up. Yeah, how about the electrical power? Are they, are they drawing electrical power off of the grid? Yeah, are they drawing electrical power? Yes, they are drawing electrical power. They like to be off of the grid, and they do have a wind turbine, and on um, some solar panels, believe it or not, they actually do have um, office systems and computers out there as well now, donated systems. Um, but the, the electrical only goes to the common buildings and does not go to the individual buildings. They do have um, heaters. Um, gas-powered heaters with sort of um, interesting ventilation systems and cabinets outside for housing the, the technology. Is it propane? So they, yeah, propane-based. I don't understand the venting, but um, it's, code, it's, it's approved by the fire marshal. Okay, my, <coughs> my, my question has been partially answered in with regard to application and uh, admission into the program. Um, but what about the, I see this as a, as a permanent solution to a hopefully temporary problem of, hopeless, of, of uh, homelessness. But what about some of the homeless that are, are going to remain homeless permanently um, and, and see no future in, in, in their life? But uh, with regard to, to those that want to change but need help getting to that change, that point where they can change their lives and, and progress. Yeah. Well, now you're asking me to put my visionary hat on, because <laughs> that's a big question. You know, in all the places I've been in the world and things I've seen, I think, you know, a participatory place where people know each other is kind of the solution. And you do, not everybody has to live that way. If you want to go down to the Alsi River in the shack and fish the rest of your life, that's my dream. But, uh, so I, I don't want to try to force everyone into, into a place-based community and this kind of thing, but um, there are people who, who, who don't want to live with other people and, they, and they, they, they aren't necessarily ever going to get to that place. And some people really do have um, problems. There are serious sociopaths uh, in corporate boardrooms. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> What are we going to do about that? I'll tell you, personally, I'm ready to help with any solution. I personally am ready to help because it's exciting and it's good work. Uh, but this kind of approach isn't necessarily for everybody. What are we going to do? Um, you know, I wish our whole economy was directed at healing the ecology and taking care of each other. There's people out there I see, and I, and I just wish I had enough blankets with me to put, put, you know, put it over them as they're sleeping out there in the cold. I think the answer is that we wake up. You know, and we help each other. Uh, honestly, like we have the resources, we can flick our finger to solve this problem as if we do it, you know, as a whole. And it, and when we won't do it all at once, it'll be a few of us doing more than our share for a while, and uh, and and then people who are homeless really asking, like asking for help uh, more than they're doing now. Um, you know, there's some homeless people I know who don't just stand there asking for help; they're actually asking to, they're asking to help. Is there something I can do? I got time in my hands, you know. Um, so I don't know. A lot of different approaches we haven't thought of yet. Um, I, I was wondering. I was wondering whether there are any percentages when you started Dignity Village. Were there any percentages of certain kinds of people? For instance, percentages of, of families, percentages of people of certain ages, or anything like that that you that you uh, asked for when the when the village started. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that they're doing a really great job right now um, recording their demographics, their ages, their ethnic backgrounds, um, the gender balance. Yeah, they're doing a great job of that. Initially, I can speak to that. Um, initially, we uh, had about probably 70% men, 3% um, women, obviously, and then an incredibly broad, diverse array of people. Um, including uh, lots of Native Americans who were there. 
So it was a very diverse mix, and I did not quantify it, but I mean, we were um, talking about all manner of different people, and, and everybody there who's a, who's a long, longer term resident, um, or is a resident, is at least 18 years old. Dignity doesn't actually have children. Um, and, but I can tell you that there were a lot of couples, too. And this is actually, I, I want to break down some of this for you, because it's really beautiful. Um, I mean, from a Tea Party's pers perspective, you know, being so concerned about spending tax money, like I said, it costs about $3 a night. They're generating it themselves. And some of the advantages over the shelter system um, are just you know, it's unbelievable. Like in the shelter system, you, you, you separate couples. Women go this way, men go that way, and children go that way. Um, you can't keep your pet. You have to give away your pet. You can't keep your stuff. You have to give that away. Um, you have to leave, even if it is freezing cold outside, early in the morning, and you can't come back until the evening. So at Dignity Village, couples stay together. They don't have to give up their pets. They can keep their belongings, and they don't have to leave. So that enables them to look for jobs and uh, get educational in support and that sort of thing so that they can be stable. Um, so those are just some of the advantages, but I think the bigger advantages that I'm really interested in is that they get to become, they, they develop a leadership capacity, they get mentored by others to learn how to use tools and acquire other skills, life skills, communication skills. So the kind of stuff that really remakes a person. Yeah, um, that's the stuff I love about it the most. Before we go to the next question, remember to fill out those cards and drop them off at the table on, on the way out tonight. <laughs>